situations that took place thousands of years, millennium before we were even, our parents even met. Don't think that there is no benefit in that information for you. And so we mentioned the verse from Surah Al-A'raf, chapter number seven, the heights, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he asked Iblis, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? Allah already knows the answer. This is for our benefit. Before this, Iblis was in the company of the Malaika, the angels. For all intents and purposes, he was a righteous creature. So much so that he had the comp he was able to keep company with angels who never disobey Allah. So when Allah commanded the angels to prostrate, he was among them, so the command extended to him as well. But he did. He didn't prostrate. We all know this. So Allah asked, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? And he said, Anna Khairun Bilu. I'm better than him. Extremely important piece of language. I am better than him. Brothers and sisters, don't ever use that language. I'm better than him. I'm better than her. We are better than them. Keep in mind that Shaitan said that. Iblis said that. The devil said that. Keep that in mind. So even in your mind, in your wildest imagination, if you feel that you're better than someone and you say it or feel it or think it, remember that you're quoting someone. You're in agreement with someone. You have the same sentiments as us as someone. And that someone is the devil. So keep that in mind. <laughs> he said, Kalaktini min naran wa kalaktuhu min teen. You created me from fire and you created him from dirt. Brothers and sisters, Iblis, Shaitan, the devil, he was the first racist. He was the first racist. In order for you and I to understand the psychology behind racism, you have to go to the root. It's one benefit for us in this story. We get to understand the psychology behind the racist. Extremely important. Allah, that was verse number 12 of Surah Araf. And now we're going to go back to Surah Al Baqarah. Chapter number 2, verse number 34. This story is mentioned many times in Quran. Why? So that we can get Ibra lessons from it. So Allah says, after the angels prostrated, Allah says, for such a do illa Iblisa. They all prostrated except Iblis. Abba, he refused. What's up, brother? And he was arrogant. He refused and he was arrogant. Allah is telling you something that you need to know about Iblis and what motivated him. He was arrogant. Keep that in mind. Allah said, I am the Lord of the Muslims. I am the Lord of the Muslims. I am the Lord of the Alhamdulillah.
Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa afturu salat wa tamu taslim Ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Mu'ana alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa radiyallahu ta'ala ala sajid al-tabi'in wa ulama al-amaleen Wa a'imat al-arbat al-mushtahidin wa muqalidihim ila yawmiddin Amma ba'd Brothers and sisters The necessary The main ingredient of racism is kibble, arrogance. That's the, that's the main thing. That's the major ingredient in racism. Kibble, arrogance, pride. And you have to understand, like our scholars said about kibble or pride, they say, well, who are Sifatu Mahmuma? Alati Takrumu Takalu Biha. That it is a blameworthy characteristic of the heart. It's a blameworthy characteristic. And it is haram to behave with it. See, a lot of times we think that because a sin, a particular sin, that you can't see it, like Stealing, you can see it. Zina, you can see it. You know, slander, you can hear it. But a lot of times we think sins of the heart are not sins because you can't quantify it. How do you know it's there? Especially if it's covered up real good. How do you know if someone, you know, they put on a good image outwardly, but in their heart they think that they are better than someone? You can't see it, so you think, oh, I'm good. No one sees it. No. It is a blameworthy characteristic of the heart. Now, this is what you have to understand. This is key to understand about Kibra. Arrogance. He said that I'm calling Sheikh Muthman then for you. Uh, he said that arrogance, the reality of the one who's afflicted with this disease of arrogance, he sees himself in relation to other people. He sees that he has a rank, a level, a station, and other people have a rank, a level, or a station. And he estimates, in his opinion, he sees that his station, his rank is above that of others. This is his opinion. This is the way. He really thinks this. Like Shaitan. I'm better than him. So the one who is arrogant, really in their mind, in their hearts of hearts, think that they are better than other people. They really believe that. That's extremely important for you to understand about the one who's afflicted with arrogance. And this is consistent with what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about the arrogant one. Batul Haq wa to Nas. They reject the truth and they look down on people. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about the arrogant one. I don't think you understand. The person who is afflicted with the disease of arrogance really, sincerely, honestly, in all truth, thinks that they are better than the other person. You have to understand that. The person doesn't think that they're doing anything wrong. They think, that I'm really better than him. I'm really better than her. You have to understand that. You don't, some of us think that the person that's arrogant knows that they're doing something wrong. No, they really believe this. And this leads to other characteristics. It leads to other character traits. The one who's arrogant, they don't really take advice from other people. 
And just like everything else, everything is not black and white. There's degrees, or you know, as we say, there's levels to this. Everybody's not the same. Some people may have a little bit, some people may have a lot. The Sheikh went on to say that the person who has it real bad, he can't even be around the person, other people. He looks at them as if they were a bunch of Hamir, like a bunch of donkeys. Like he, he really believes it, like I'm really above, I'm better than all of you. Why are you even around me? Why are you even talking to me? Like he, he, this bothers him. The one who has it real bad. You ever give someone some sincere advice? Even if it's private, no one's around. And they get incensed, they get angry. Like, who are you talking to? It's because of arrogance. He don't feel like you should be even talking to him, much less giving him advice. Why? Because he's better than you in his mind. They reject the truth. They reject the advice. And he went on to mention how the one who has this bad that the person, they can't, they can't avoid all other blameworthy characteristics in order to maintain that opinion in their mind. They'll get to lying. They'll get to cheating, stealing, a whole bunch of other things. Why? To maintain that false opinion they have about themselves in relation to other people. That's an individual. What about whole groups of people who have this opinion? It's the foundation of racism. The Sheikh mentioned that there's causes, typical causes of race, uh, of kibra, pride. Someone may be arrogant because of their lineage. Some people may be arrogant because of their knowledge. Some people may be arrogant because of their wealth. There's a whole list of reasons. Uh, I think a better word is justifications. Justifications for kibbutz or arrogance. And the reality behind it is that the person or the people, they're not really thinking about the one who gave them these gifts. They're not thinking about where they came from and where they're going. You didn't even exist. You wasn't even a thought. Your origin is a disgusting fluid that if you saw it on your pants, you'd wash it off. That's where we all come from. And we're going back to nothing, crumble up dirt and bones only to be resurrected and judged. The one who has Kibra, he or she, not thinking about all of these things. And so, the cure for Kibra or arrogance, brothers, can you fill up the gaps? The cure, is in two, knowledge cure, action cure. You have to introduce knowledge and information and learning and teaching that is contrary to that. And the action cure is that you have to do, you have to act in such a way opposite than the way arrogance would have you act unnaturally, in a fake way, until it becomes real, until it becomes your natural disposition. Like, for example, if I'm arrogant and you walk into the room, my arrogance will tell me, you know what, I'm not going to say salam to him until he says salam to me first. But you know, you're fighting the arrogance within yourself. So you make yourself give that brother or that sister the salam first before they give it to you. You're fighting against it. So you have to do what arrogant, the opposite of what arrogance will have you do. We said arrogance or 
or Kimber is the foundation of racism. Let's go back to what uh, Kimber would have you do. Remember, the racists really believe that they're better than someone. So they have to always make sure that their reality substantiates that false notion. Remember we said that the arrogant person sees that he has a rank and everyone else's rank is beneath them. So the racist person or the racist group or the racist society creates mechanisms, systems, a hierarchy to make sure that they're at the top and everyone else is at the bottom. And in this system, in this country, it's well known that white is at the top and black is at the bottom. Everybody who comes to this country knows it, whether they openly admit it or not, whether they verbalize it or not, they know it. That's why you have people, they know this is a hierarchy. White top, black bottom. And so that's why many people, even from quote unquote black countries, even from countries on the African continent, all of them, most of them, when they come to this country, they lobby for the right to be legally white. Even though they know they're not white, but they know this is a hierarchy system, a hierarchical system. We here for education, we here for money. And white is at the top, black is at the bottom. I'm gonna do everything I can do not to be black and everything I can do to be white. And that's why some people, you may you say, oh, he's black like me. Look at his documents, he's legally white. And people, that the leaders in their community fought for that right to be called legally white. That's the reality. And you have to understand that when you've been conquered by a person or people, you begin to take on the mindset and the characteristics of those who have conquered you. Especially if you live under them for a long time. Our scholars have explained this and articulated this many times, like Ibn Khaldun in his Mukaddimah. You have to understand what people think. So, people come here, and you may not like it because you know you like, no, ain't nobody over me. That's not what anybody else think. And a lot of people rejoice in the fact, they say, man, listen, I may not be white, but at least I'm not black. Even the poorest white person who just generational poverty and you know just debauchery and everything, even they say, listen, actually, man, my teeth may be rotten now. I may not take the bath in a whole week, but one thing I got going for me, I'm not black. That's the society. You may not like me saying it. You may feel, feel uncomfortable by the fact that I'm saying it, but you know it's true. That tells you that shaitan is in control of the mindsets of people. And it has even crept into the Muslim woman. And we're supposed to know better. Because everything I mentioned today from the Quran and the Sunnah, we all supposed to know that. I didn't say nothing high level or advanced today. And I try not to say things high level and advanced. I always try to keep it extremely basic. So I'm pretty sure most of you in here, if not all of you, every hadith or ayat that I mentioned you heard already, many times. We're supposed to know these things. But yet in the Muslim community, you have those of us who think that we're, they're better than other people. Is it their fault? No. They've been brainwashed. They've been just like everyone else. And if you don't believe me, after the Juma Kutbah, those of you who are not black, have a conversation with any random black person in here. All of us have a story. Wild stories. Praying in the masjid next to a brother. Kufi, Thobar. And then a the brother praying right next to you will turn around after the Salat and ask you, are you Muslim? <laughs> we just 
the train together. What are you talking about? Why are you listening? All of us have crazy stories like that. What? Why you can't be Muslim? You're black. Or they might say something like, Subhanallah, I heard you recite Fatiha, mashallah. You're very intelligent. There's a comma at the end of that, not a period. You're very intelligent for a black person. Because in our mind, black people down here, they haven't contributed anything to society. They're nothing. And most of them, when they come here, they'll tell you if they're honest. They may be too shy, they might not mention it. They're instructed. You want to be successful? Stay away from those black people. You come to me, stay away from them. They're nothing but gangbangers and they're useless. They're lazy. The ones you see are probably the exception. They may know what happened when they, they, they're here. Because if they took that advice, they would be here. But that's the honest conversation we're going to have. So we already mentioned what the Sheikh said about curing Kibra or arrogance. So how do you cure it or treat it on a bigger level? You're not talking about just treating yourself. You're talking about trying to eradicate this thing from the society. How do you deal with that? The same way. Education. We, when I say we, Muslims, in all of our masajid, in all of our mas masjids and, Islam and, and, and Islamic centers, including this one, we have to have education where not only we talk about the Quran of Islam, you know, the, the, the basics of Islam, like Aqidah and the Farqai, like we're doing. We have to keep doing that, but we also have to have history classes. We have to have classes in history where not only the history of Islam is taught, because right now, as I'm speaking, people are talking about the history of Islam in this country. And guess what they're leaving out? The black part of it. They're not talking about the slaves who brought Islam with them over here. They're not talking about the Africans who were here before the, uh, the, even the slavery period. They're not talking about that. And so to a lot of people, Islam began to grow in the late 60s after the establishment of the MSA. They're not talking about the other part. That's racism, even if you don't believe it or not, whether you accept it or not. Because you leave it out part of the history. That's just not black people's history. That's the history of this country. Islam in this country. Why leave it out? These are not myths and folk tales. These are documented evidence, anthropological proof, everything that establishes these facts. Oral and written history from the time period and looking back. So education needs to take place. Not only in the so-called immigrant masters, in indigenous masters, African American masters, because most African American Muslims don't even know the history. So if you don't know it, how do you expect them to know it? So we're in the beginning stages of developing a curriculum for that here, where all of the masters should do the same thing. Not only during Black History Month, it should be part of the regular curriculum. Massive education. When I said massive education, I know a lot of you thought, yeah, we, maybe we need to speak to the politicians and the people so they can start, you know, changing or correcting the textbooks. You hold your breath and wait for that if you want. No, we have the ability to make changes in our communities right now and in our families right now. We we'll have people who like to do that stuff to lobby and debate and, and communicate with uh, the, uh, the legislature and do all that with the textbooks. But in the meantime, we have the ability to do this ourselves here, yeah, right now. In fact, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant when he said in Surah Al-Hujurat, Ya, ya ayyuhal nas, inna kalakanakum min dhakar wa unta. 
وتعاونكم شعوبا وكبائل لي تعرفوا إن أكرمكم إن الله أتقاكم O mankind, we created you from a male and a female, and we made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. That's why Allah created our diversity, so that we will know one another. I explained it many times before. That means so, so that you can have knowledge of self, and you should know other people's not history. Don't be afraid to cut the phone off now. Now we all make mistakes. So that we know one another. And so that you will know yourselves. So we have to do that. That's our job. As Muslims, this is why Allah created our diversity. You read the commentary of that. Well, I believe I mentioned it last week. Right? You're supposed to do this. How many times, I don't know how many times I've heard it. When we talk about these issues, we say, Psh, no, don't talk about that. Brother, there's no black and no white. It's just Islam. There's no black and no white in Islam. It's just Islam. And then they'll quote that same verse. And the verse actually means opposite of what they're saying. Just because they don't want to talk about it. Lead to honorable so that you may know yourselves and others. Sweeping issues under the rug is not going to make it go away. It's just going to make someone trip over it. And then have resent of the fact that you made them fall. So we have to know one another. We have to know the history. Why? Because that's going to undo the mindset that you think you're better than someone. But I think I'm better than him. Extremely important. So we have to do this. And we also, we again, we have to be consistent with it. And we also have to be reminded, I mentioned a hadith where the Prophet Wasallam said that Kibra is rejecting the truth and looking down on people. In the same hadith, narrated by Ibn Mas'ud, and you can find a Muslim, the Prophet Wasallam said, La yadkul jannata. من كان في قلبه مثقال مثقال ذرة من كبر. Who have whoever has an atom's weight of kibr in their heart will not enter paradise. It's better to get the arrogance out of our hearts right now, rather than have to be purified of this kibr in the next life. لا يدخل الجنة. You will not enter paradise. Think about this. Why are we doing all of this? Ramadan's coming up. We're going to be stuck eating. I don't know what time in the morning. 3, 4 in the morning, all the way to 7, 8 at night. Why are you doing this? Because you like starving yourself? No, you want gender. We want paradise. You will not enter paradise. He will not enter gender. Man can if he come be hate. Who has in his heart with call of Dalton and Kibler. Whoever has the smallest speck of Kibler or arrogance in their hearts. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the Kibler from our hearts. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove racism from our internal communities and our world. We're not a of the dunya hasna wa fila akira ti hasna wa kina da bin nar. Alhumma tasla wa mi tasla wa tabrati da wa jarabi wa dhikram. Subhana rabbi ka rabbi lizati amma yasifun wa salamu ala al-mursaleen. الحمد لله رب العالمين يقوم تصبحه